Hi there. We have a new version of Scikit-Learn, version 1.6. If you want to learn more about it, you can definitely check the release highlights over here. But if you want to get a good impression of just all the different features that have been added, you can go to the release history, check out version 1.6, and you can see this long, long list of features. There really are a lot of things in this one. Scikit-Learn is a big community effort, so it's also nice to see this section at the bottom over here where you can see all the different contributors that contributed APR to the project. But the main goal of this video is to not necessarily go through all of these changes that we have over here, but instead to show off a few core features and to also highlight a few features that I think are definitely interesting. One of the first features that I want to talk about is this new support for the Array API. One of the main goals of this API is to also allow you to send in PyTorch arrays, which might also allow you to use the GPU for some of your scikit-learn workloads. And to demonstrate all of this, I am going to be using a Colab environment because that is going to make it easy for me to show you a bit of a benchmark that uses a GPU. Now, for this all to work at the current moment, you're going to want to uninstall Gensim because this version of Gensim that is currently installed will block this version from SciPy from installing. But also for this demo, it's important that you're going to install this Array API compatibility package together with scikit-learn version 1.6 and that you set this flag. Again, the API that I'm talking about here is a little bit experimental, so if you want to repeat these steps, there is a little bit of extra work involved. That said, let's scroll down and have a look at the quick demo. What I'm doing over here is I am making a regression data set. There's a bunch of samples. There's a bunch of noise, and I have my X, Y pair, as I would normally. And I've got a pipeline down below over here. The pipeline has a PCA, followed up by a rich regression. One thing to note here, which is a little bit of cherry picking, is that both of these two systems are potentially good candidates to benefit from a GPU. Not all estimators out there will be able to benefit as much, so definitely feel free to keep that grain of salt in the back of your mind. Having said that, what you can see below is that I am timing how long it all takes to split a train test set, to fit my uh, pipeline, to make predictions, and then to also give a score. And you can see that if I were to do all of this, it takes about 25, 26 seconds or so. Now, let's contrast that to doing this with PyTorch, and I'm doing this in a special way. Again, I am making my regression as I would normally, but after that, I am turning these two arrays into PyTorch arrays, and I'm also designating them to go onto the CUDA device. Effectively, this is what's going to allow me to use GPU. Then, I basically write all of my code as before, it's just that I'm going to add this context manager. This context manager is the thing that's going to allow us to use our array API dispatching. By doing this, we are effectively telling scikit-learn to, as much as it can, use the Array API internally for the code block that follows. And there are components inside of this model pipeline over here that it can fall back to. And the scoring function over here is also something that the new API supports. And suddenly, by just doing this, we are seeing a speed up for sure. We are now at about 1.8 seconds, which we're going to want to contrast to 26 seconds that we had before. Also notice that the R2 score is exactly the same, so numeric details notwithstanding, we should expect the same model to come out. But the main thing that's the win here is just this speed up. So that means that if you have a pipeline that could benefit from using a GPU, there is more stuff to play with inside of scikit-learn from version 1.6 going forward. Next up is a new function from the datasets API. You can now use this fetch file function. The thinking here is that you might have some sort of file online. This could be on GitHub, but you will have some sort of a file that's on a path on the internet, so to say. In this particular case, I've got chickweight.csv, just to give an example. This chickweight over here, though, represents a path that's on my disk. So if I were to inspect it, you can see that it's a proper path and that there is some scikit-learn data stored on my machine. And the thinking here is that by doing it this way, whenever I rerun this function, it doesn't fetch the same file over and over again. It's able to use a cache that's local. From here though, I could go ahead and reuse this chick weight path in polars, so to say, just to get a data frame going out. But the main thing that we're hoping is that this might make it somewhat easier to just grab any file that's hosted on the internet and use them in interactive notebooks together with scikit-learn. There are a lot of files on GitHub and other places and not having to write custom code for that is just kind of nice. 
This function also has some extra features. You can configure it to retry if the first time you try to reach this URL, it breaks. And you can also check a SHA hash to make sure that you're actually downloading the right file. But feel free to check out the docs on this one if you're interested. The next big feature that's worth talking about revolves all around metadata routing. It's a relatively new API, but it's been supported for a few versions now. And the whole point with this API is that you can allow for extra parameters at times. For example, we have the accuracy score over here, and maybe we would like to use the accuracy score, but in a way that we can also add sample weights whenever we are scoring our estimator. So what recent versions allow you to do is it allows you to take your scoring function and it allows you to set a score request on it indicating, in this case, that the sample weight is going to be used, and that it should also be routed to the scoring function. You could do something very similar when you have normal estimators as well. For example, I have a logistic regression cross-validation object over here, and instead of setting the score request, I'm able to set the fit request. In doing so, I'm also able to pass sample weight along to the logistic regression that's under the hood here, and it's basically the same principle. Whenever we're going to call the fit method, we're going to route some extra metadata. And whenever we're going to use this score, we're also interested in routing some extra metadata. Note, by the way, that internally inside of this estimator, I'm using group kfold as my cross validation mechanism. And this actually also expects a bit of metadata. It requires some sort of a group. Because the group is required here, you don't have to specify it manually, but you do have to set it for the score and for the fit over here because there's not a base assumption that you will always need it. However, if you were now to use a function like cross-validate, then you can set these parameters like the sample weight and the groups, and everything will just be routed as you would expect because we've configured it as such. This is what metadata routing basically allows for. Now here's the reason why I bring it up. As of scikit-learn 1.6, a lot more estimators and utilities now support this metadata routing. You can check the release notes to see all the different features, but it's a pretty long list, which is why I figured I might give it some extra attention. There are just a couple of these advanced features for which this metadata routing is just going to make your day a whole lot easier. And it's great to see that we can support more elaborate pipelines in more sets of estimators. It also wouldn't be a scikit-learn release if there weren't just a few speedups here and there that are just kind of nice to mention. And the one speedup that I think is worth mentioning in this particular release is the speed up in the isolation forest. What you're looking at here is a function that I can easily run in different versions of scikit-learn with some extra settings. And in particular, what I'm doing now is I'm using this parallel setting in this function. If this is set to true, then I'm going to be using this context manager that is going to allow me to actually make my predictions in parallel. Isolation forests are pretty popular in the realm of outlier detection, so it's nice to see that we can actually speed up inference, especially when you're dealing with big data sets. This really can shave off a whole bunch of time. You can see the results of the quick benchmark down below here. And the main observation is that across the two different versions, 1.5 and 1.6, the train time really stays about the same. And the prediction time roughly also stays the same, except for when you set the parallel flag to true. In that case, you can see that it's about four times as quick as its counterparts. This isn't a huge feature in the larger scheme of things, but it's always a forgotten theme in these releases that a lot of the scikit-learn tools actually become a fair bit quicker. So that's also why I want to spend just a little bit of time showcasing this. And it's an especially nice feature because isolation forests, in the end, are a really popular option for outlier detection. There's actually a new estimator that makes an appearance inside of scikit-learn version 1.6, and that is this frozen estimator over here. It's a bit of a different estimator than you might be used to, though. It's not a machine learning algorithm or a transformer of such. Instead, it is really just a utility estimator of sorts. Here's the use case. Suppose that I've got some transformer and some sort of a classifier. It might be the case that I'm dealing with a data set where I just want to have a transformer that's trained once, and maybe I want to have more than one classifier afterwards. But it would be a shame if I had to retrain this standard scaler over and over again when I add it to a pipeline. Normally, in a scikit-learn pipeline, you might have a transformer and that's followed by an estimator. But when you call dot .fit on that pipeline, well, then we're calling dot .fit on the transformer and on the estimator that follows. And it would just be kind of nice if we could pass some sort of a 
estimator in here that's just frozen, something that we know for sure doesn't need to be fitted again, and that can save a bunch of compute. This is what the frozen estimator is for. It is really just a mechanism to take a transformer or an estimator that we already have and to make sure that the dot fit doesn't change it. So in the demo that I have over here, you can see that I've got my standard scaler and I fit that. That's the part that's trained. I have a logistic regression that hasn't been trained at all yet. But what I can then do is I can take this transformer, turn that into something that is uh, properly frozen, and then I can use this frozen transformer as if it's a normal transformer. I can just call dot transform on it. The next bit is slightly cheeky, but it demonstrates the point. And that is that I'm taking my original transformer over here and I'm overwriting the fit method. This is something you should never do, by the way. But the thinking is that if the transform.fit method were ever to be called, then it should start throwing an error because I'm doing something in here that should never really happen. However, if I were to make the pipeline with my frozen component and then call fit on it, it shouldn't break because I'm not using the internal transformer that it started out with over here. And just to prove that that's indeed the case, I can now call make pipeline. I put the frozen estimator in there, followed by my classifier, and I can call fit no problemo. But if I were to do the same with the original transformer, this would totally break. Also note, by the way, that if you indeed pass a frozen object, you do see that in the representation over here as well. You can still explore all of these items as you would normally. There's just a little bit of a visual helper over here to make you aware of the fact that indeed, we are dealing with a frozen estimator as opposed to a normal standard scalar over here. If you want to learn more about the frozen estimator, know that there is now also a new example section where you can learn more about different use cases. One use case that I want to call out specifically is that you can use your frozen estimator together with the calibrated classifier cross-validation estimator, which was released in a recent release as well. And the reason why it makes sense in this instance is because this estimator is going to calibrate the probabilities. But in order to do that, you don't have to change the classifier that's internal. So it can actually make sense to be a little bit strict about the behavior and wrap the classifier in a frozen estimator before passing it on to any meta estimator that follows. By doing this, you can really guarantee that we're not gonna retrain anything when we are going to be calling the calibrated classifier uh, dot fit method. Uh, stuff like this is also a really good use case for the frozen estimator. Now, before wrapping up, I figured I might give a shout out to two features in particular that are also worth mentioning. The first one being that there's now support for free threaded CPython 3.13. This is an experimental new version of Python. The thinking here is that there is a version of Python 3.13 with a T at the end that indicates that we might have a version of Python that doesn't come with a GIL or a global interpreter lock. In short, this might be great for parallel code, but it is also a different version of Python, quote unquote, altogether. You have to install it separately. Note that this version of Python is of course a little bit experimental. So we should also expect that the support that you have over here is on its own also just slightly experimental. But for those of you that like to fiddle around, this might be a fun feature to try. The final feature worth mentioning can be found at the end of the release notes for version 1.6, and it revolves around the new developer API for third-party libraries. For most people out there, this won't be something that you're gonna interface with directly. However, if you maintain a scikit-learn plugin, then you might like to know that there are some differences that should make it easier to maintain scikit-learn plugins. The main feature that comes to mind is that instead of using the check array functionality that checks features that go into an estimator, you can now actually use validate data instead. This validate data over here extends what check array does, and it also handles things like remembering feature names as well as some counts of some shapes. If you're maintaining a library that's a scikit-learn plugin, definitely check this out as well as some of these other features because there are a bunch of small changes. As always, a very big shout out to this long list of contributors and maintainers that have been helping in making this release. Scikit-learn in the end is a community project and a lot of its success really depends on the community. So it's been nice to see so many people make their contributions in this one.